Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading verses 12 to 17. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience, as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Rick Gustafson, and I serve as an elder in, uh, at Grace Community Church. I oversee the area of adult ministries. And uh, as you can see, I'm not the regular guy that's up here today. Uh, some of you maybe didn't see the newsletter or the bulletin that came out this week, and um, I'm gratified that you came anyway if you did see the bulletin or the Newsweek newsletter this week. Um, the regular guy... Um, You know, has a trademark navy blue sport coat. You can see that's not me. Uh, But uh, I'm here to uh, offer some respite and do this for my friend. He he calls me friend. And uh, so this is a a very small thing that I can do for him so that he has an opportunity to enjoy uh, family, uh, family gatherings, and and, uh, have a week of respite after after going through uh, quite the year that we've gone through. Um, So in a sense... uh, I'm not the regular guy, but I am a regular guy. I'm a regular guy in the sense that uh, this is not my preferred place to be at front on on the stage. My preferred place to be is actually more like being back here. This is my preferred spot behind the scenes or at the at the back of the stage. But God, in His mercy and grace and love, knows that I need this push. And so I'm pushed up to the front of here. Uh, my wife, Vicki, and I have attended Grace Community Church since before it was Grace Community Church. Uh, we can trace our roots back to uh, when the, a small group of people met at Garfield School. And we're in search of uh, uh, com- combining into a, a, a new congregation and in search of a pastor. And so I can trace our roots back to that far. Um, I'm honored to be here and be able to stand before you because uh, I am and always will be a sinner, but I've been saved by grace. And that's really the overarching message of this, of this passage of Scripture today that uh, Pastor Tim read for us, and that is it's grace. So now, what a year, difference a year makes. On January the 3rd, 2020, I was dismissed from physical therapy, three months of physical therapy for uh, lower back and, and leg issues that I've been suffering through off and on from 2008 until uh, 2020. Um, it really hampered or hindered my running um, and was painful. And uh, uh, the last couple years that I spent as uh, elementary principal at Ogden, I spent in pain, lower back pain. Uh, the, the old song, every move I make, every breath I take, well, that was me. That it, 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 it didn't remind me of anybody, it just made me hurt. That's what it did. Uh, so for me, Uh, 2020 was probably like Charles Dickens' tale of two cities 
that starts out, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. It was the worst of times in that looking back at 2020, we're glad it's behind us. We're going to look ahead now to uh, 2021. Um, pandemic, cultural upheaval, um, just every, everything that could be thrown out and, and uh, thrown up uh, took place in 2020. For me, it was the best of times in that I had an opportunity to, uh, because of how I could run without pain, I ran 1,092 miles this last year. Uh, peaking in July at 120 miles in a month, and I hadn't done that since that I last did my marathon training. So in that respect, it's the best of times, and, and you understand it's the best of times for me because my running time is my prayer and meditation time. And so when I can do that and I don't have pain to, uh, to uh, obstruct or get in my way, then uh, I, I can uh, be that much um, closer to God in, in, in and during that time. Um, in the year 2020, I had the opportunity uh, to travel uh, to Colorado with our, my daughter, my lovely daughter, and her handsome son, uh, my handsome son-in-law. And we stayed at Frisco, Colorado for a week. We had an opportunity to climb a couple of mountains. Frisco is located within uh, easy reach or easy destination of four mountain ranges. Two of the mountain ranges were within 300 feet of where we were staying. Uh, they same, share the same trailhead, and so uh, we... Uh, with, our five -year -old, with my five-year-old granddaughter, climbed the one peak, which was about 10,500 feet. And then uh, um, Jackie and, and Jade uh, went back down the mountain, and then uh, we, we went with them until the trailhead separated, and then we went on to climb Mount Victoria. And um, I got to see uh, what life was like and, and what the, uh, the area looked like from 11,776 feet. Uh, the last 800 feet were challenging because there were still six-foot snow drifts that were blocking the trail, so we had to make our own trail. But we did reach the peak and uh, <clears throat> able to look out over Frisco, Colorado. And what came to my mind at the time was that this must be what Moses experienced when God uh, said, you're not going to the promised land, but I'm going to let you see the promised land. And so he took him up to the mountain and he looked over the promised land. Uh, it was beautiful. It was serene. It was actually surreal, too. Um, so that was, my, that was the best of times this past year. Now, God, I have to say, I, and I always will say, has had a plan and a purpose for me in spite of myself. My life plan included joining the United States Air Force and becoming a fighter pilot. Or becoming an automotive designer and design cars for the Ford Motor Company. Or become a high school history teacher, and marry the girl that I dated my senior year in college. That was my life plan. Now, God had a different plan for me, and part of that plan included being an elementary teacher, not a high school teacher, but an elementary teacher. And I taught sixth grade in a town of 700 people in southwest Iowa. And instead of marrying that girl that I dated my senior year in college, who really wasn't that into me, I was more into her than she was into me, and, and so we had to part ways. But what I did do is I married a young lady who loved Jesus, was intelligent, had an outgoing personality, and had blue eyes with a twinkle in them of orneriness that's still there today. Um, God's plan for me was to be a teacher, and if nothing else, to be a teacher for at least one student one student that connected with Vicki uh, several years back on Facebook. And I just want to read that message because if there was nothing else that I did in the time that I was a school teacher, this is why I was there. Uh, she writes to Vicki, I saw your post on Dawn's page a couple of months ago and wanted to send you a message then. I just wanted to say hello and that I hope your family is as great as you all look. Congratulations on your beautiful family. Rick was my sixth grade teacher and probably the first positive male role model in my life. I know teachers don't always realize the impact they have or the legacy they leave in their students. I just wanted him and you to know that his influence was a blessing to me at that time. I always remember that his expectations were high, but boundaries were clear. He always let you know exactly how you were doing and truly cared about our growth academically and otherwise. May God continue to bless you and your family, and please tell Mr. Gustafson hello and thanks. If for nothing else, that's why I became a teacher. 
And that's why God's plan was different from my plan. So that <clears throat> takes us then to our, our text for today. Our text today comes from uh, 1 Timothy in the first chapter, and it's verses 12 through 17. And, and Pastor Tim read those, those verses to us. In the broader textual context of this, of this uh, book, uh, Paul's writing to Timothy, Timothy, who's been sent to Ephesus in order to correct some false teaching that's going on. And he's telling Timothy to be bold and teach the gospel uh, because of, of the, he's, he knows that uh, Timothy's going to run into some uh, obstructions from the, the people that are doing the false teaching. He launches into this letter without his usual trademark of thanksgiving. Uh, the book of Galatians, or the letter to the Galatians was the only other letter like that, uh, whereas uh, he went right into the business at hand, and that was uh, to start talking to, to Timothy about what his task was going to be. He also um, digressed in that he went to, uh, he talked a little bit about the law and what the, the purpose of the law is, but he finished that passage up in verse 11 with talking about the glorious gospel, which inspired him to move into uh, verses 12 through 17. And he personalized that glorious gospel because Paul knew who he was and what he was and uh, how much of the difference that Jesus Christ had made in his life. Um, in sheer wonder at the grace that was lavished upon him, Paul made himself exhibit A. And today I want to make myself exhibit A as, as this isn't so much a story of me unpacking this scripture because it is so rich. I said in Bible study yesterday, this is like eating chocolate cheesecake. It is so, so rich. But this message is probably more of a story of a Christian's journey or a pilgrim's progress, as it were, that the grace of God that has been lavished upon me up until this present day. So verse 12 starts off with, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. And that brings us to the first point in your outline, and that is that we give thanks for personal grace. Verses 12 through 14, Paul stops his instructions to Timothy at this point with this digression where the Holy Spirit has led him or reminded him of actually who he was. He was a religious zealot and a high-ranking Pharisee who blasphemed God and violently persecuted Christians up until the point of death. That's who Paul is. Or that's, who, uh, that's a reminder of who he is. Chuck Swindoll, in his uh, Insights Bible Application Guide uh, on this passage, wrote this. Thankfully for Paul, grace came to the rescue. As believers whom God has rescued from the hell-bound path we used to walk, we should regularly take time to praise and thank God for the mercy he's shown in our lives. Just as no one can ignore or deny the power of a changed life, so no one whose life has been changed by the mercy of God can remain unmoved or ungrateful. Well, this is my opportunity to praise God because I am grateful for the mercy that he's shown me. In my early years and early remembrances, um, I look back to that very first part of, of verse 12 where he said he was appointed. That means he was chosen and what came to mind as I was studying this was a, a time when I wasn't chosen. And so that's why being chosen is so important to me. I was probably nine or ten years old. And we, as a small group of kids that were growing up in a small town, we had collective and ongoing baseball games, uh, wiffle ball games, football games. Whatever the season was, that's what we were doing. And this particular day, it was going to happen to be, it was going to be wiffle ball. And so we're pick two captains. Usually the two captains were the most athletic and the, and the coolest guys of the group. And um, then they each chose sides. And it got down. To, I wasn't getting chosen, by the way. And so everybody's getting chosen. One, Then the, the other captain would choose, and then the other captain would choose. I wasn't getting chosen. And I'm down to the last guy. And the guy that had to choose me started to cry. How do you suppose that makes you feel as a 9 or 10-year-old boy? I'm so bad that he's crying that I'm going to be on his team. So when Paul writes that, it, that we've been appointed, that really resonated with me because that means that I was chosen. I, and I can put that behind me. I don't have to look back at that. I grew up in the Evangelical Free Church of Chiron, Iowa. And my first experience of coming to Christ was at age 6 in Sunday school class. Anne Hewitt was my Sunday school teacher during that time. 
and Ann Hewitt had a heart for child evangelism. So every class each week reflected her desire to see children coming to Christ. And I don't mean to make light of this, but I joke that if a child did not pray to have Jesus come into their heart during class, then as a surefire backup for Sunday school always ended with everyone singing the song, Into My Heart. And I don't know if that's just a free church type of song, if anybody's familiar with that, but it goes like this. Into my heart, into my heart, Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. So, like I said, every class followed up with that, and that song has stayed with me all these years. Um, And I give thanks to those people in my early years, Anne Hewitt being one. Another, uh, other individuals um, who have long since passed away, but Rose Larson was uh, significant, Jesse Benson, my grandmother, Minnie Gustafson, my first cousin, James Gustafson, and Bob Screen. All of those people were uh, study school teachers throughout my time, from the time I was five years old until the time I graduated from high school. And I give thanks for those people because these are the people that planted the seed in my heart not knowing if it would even take root. Uh, Fortunately, it did take root. Um, At one point, the ground became fertile at at one point in time. It was hard and rocky uh, for a time in my life, but it became fertile. So Sunday school teachers, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and your willingness to put yourself into the instruction of young children. You're planting seeds that you don't know if they're going to blossom Uh, And it may take years and years for that to happen. But thank you. Verse 13, Paul writes uh, a very, very uh, self-depreciating list of adjectives that describe him. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an arrogant man, but I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. So that leads to point A, and that is that God's grace is unconditional. Paul is using some very strong words to describe his former self. And in a similar manner, Paul describes our condition and salvation. And he did this in in the book of Titus, in Titus where he wrote, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It's kind of a parallel passage to uh, today's text. David Platt writes in his his book, Christ-Centered Exposition. There is nothing in Paul to draw God to him. Paul's salvation originated in God and God alone. And the same is true for you and me. We are not saved based on any condition in us. We are saved solely on account of sovereign grace in God. His grace is unconditional. Blasphemer, persecutor, violent man, as the NIV says, these are all words that describe me. Blasphemer is the same word that's used in the ESV, the CSB, the NASB, the NIV. It all used that same word, that same expression, blasphemer. Blasphemer is someone who engages in the act or the offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God or sacred things or profane talk. Okay, that's hitting me. Um, And one of the commentaries I read also noted that blasphemy is, is a form of denial of Christ. And that's definitely hit me right between the eyes of the number of times in my life that I've denied Christ by either not saying anything when something should be said or not witnessing or um, telling what Christ has done in my life at an appropriate time. I denied Christ by not saying anything. I became a persecutor. Um, and the, the Holy Spirit told me, you know, I'm thinking, okay, now who have I persecuted? I haven't willingly or done that uh, not necessarily willingly, but I have not done that purposefully. Uh, but then 
um, it was put into my head, oh yeah, what did you do to your little brother growing up? My, my brother is two years younger than I am, and uh, so I was always just big enough and strong enough that I could overpower him at will. And so I wasn't very, very nice to my younger brother growing up. I, I was a persecutor. And in the CSB, um, it said, uh, it translated um, to arrogant man. Other translations talked about uh, an insolent opponent or a violent aggressor or a violent man, but the CSB said Ar uh, um, arrogant man. And then th that's what hit me between the eyes was, oh yeah, pride. Pride is at the root of what I would define as far as my arrogance. There was no condition, nothing that I said in, in me that elevated me to salvation or being chosen by God because of his love for me and his mercy and for his grace. And so that brings me to my middle years. My middle years, I, I count as the, the time I was in junior high, about 12, 13 years of age. Um, Bible, I spent two years at Bible camp at Twin Lakes in Manson, Iowa, uh, as a 12-year-old and, the, and then again as a 13-year-old. And as Bible camps go, you know that there's going to be a campfire at some point in time during the week. And uh, at campfire, the week that I was there when I was 12 years old, I came forward and dedicated my life to Christ. Now, I had done that at six, but... I felt like I, I really felt moved to do that at age 12. And so um, I, I uh, dedicated my life to Christ at that time and then went back uh, home and lived just like I'd lived before, uh, being mean to my brother and all other sorts of things that, that you do when you're 12 years old and you, you don't know any better. Um, 13, I went back to camp and at campfire. I went forward again, and I confessed I had not been anything that uh, was a life that was worthy of Christ, and I wanted to rededicate my life. And so I rededicated my life at age 13, and then went back home, and then just continued to live like I was living before, being mean to my brother, and uh, all the other things that you do now as 13, 14, and 15-year-olds uh, when you're not thinking about uh, the long view. Uh, a person to thank during that period of time, he happened to be the camp pastor both years, was Pastor Orville Sustad. He was from Colorado. I don't remember where. His son Mark was in my cabin both years, and that's about all I know of or remember, but, but he made a profound influence on me in, in making, um, opening uh, my heart up to wanting to come to Christ. So uh, Pastor or Orville Sustad is somebody that I want to thank. And then I entered my high school and uh, college years, and I doubt that anybody that knew me during that time would not have known that I was a Christian because of uh, the way I lived. Um, but I did have some people to thank and some people that looked after me, some people that took care of me during that period of time. My cousin, James, uh, James Gustafson, and his wife, Mary, took me under their wing and would invite me to go to church with them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and Jim and I would sing duets, and Mary would accompany when we'd have special occasions at, at uh, like a Sunday night church or a New Year's Eve service or, or that sort of thing. Um, and they also hired me to do odd jobs uh, around the place, and uh, so it was a means for me to earn money when I was, uh, like I said, in high school and in college. But especially during this time of life, uh, this verse comes to mind and it comes from the book of Psalms. Psalms 25, verse 7 says, Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Because, B, God's grace demonstrates patience. As I entered my college years, I, I went to um, Morningside College in Sioux City, Iowa. And I call these college years my wilderness years, where I kind of stumbled around and went in circles for a long, long time. Uh, I would term my life during my college years as a life of debauchery and stupidity while I was supposedly getting smarter. Uh, there was lots of alcohol, lots of partying, especially during my sophomore year. I, I'm amazed that I didn't get on academic probation during that year. Weekends would more often than not begin on a Wednesday or a Thursday night instead of the traditional Friday night. And by weekends, that means going to the Dodge Inn in a neighborhood in, in uh, Morningside in that area of Sioux City. Um, in my arrogance, I saw the Religious Life Council and the people that uh, were part of the Religious Life Council at Morningside as just mere Pharisees. And again, there's that arrogant and that pride uh, that I was better than them and that they were just a bunch of Pharisees. 
I don't really have anyone necessarily to thank during this period of time because I was lost. And the pull of the culture was a lot stronger on me than what I knew what was the right thing, to, the right way to live or the right thing to do. So in many instances, I can only count my survival due to the grace of God having purpose for my life. Verse 14. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Now, as an illustration, uh, an artist once submitted a painting of Niagara Falls to an art exhibition, but neglected to give it a title. And so the gallery came up with the whimsical words, more to follow. Niagara Falls, which, if you're familiar with that, has been spilling billions and billions of gallons of water over uh, the falls itself for thousands of years, more than met the needs of those below. And it becomes a fit emblem for the floods of God's grace. There's always more to follow. And as James says, he gives us more grace. And so in verse 14, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me. It's a fit emblem of God's grace that I've experienced in my story of how I came to Christ. Uh, the song, I Stand Amazed in the Presence, comes to mind. And the lyrics of that song... I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could have loved me, a sinner condemned unclean. But here's the good news. And that's how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And that love for me sustained me during that period of time. God protected me in spite of myself, and God blessed me in spite of who I am. Who I am. And the grace of God overflowed for me because God's grace is purposeful. God knew a long before, 61 years ago, that on this day, at this hour, and in this place, that I would be standing in front of you and standing for, in front of those of you that are online and telling the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And so now I've graduated from college and I'm entering my young adult years. I have a degree in elementary education and I'm looking for a job. And I could have easily gotten a job in Sioux City according to the principal that I had uh, uh, in the building that I had done my student teaching and to my cooperating teacher. Uh, but Sioux City didn't, uh, didn't hire until August. So if I wanted to wait till August, I could probably get a position in Sioux City. But I knew in my heart that I had to get out of town. I had to get away from the influences and the places and the people that I've been surrounding myself with during this period of time. And so I looked elsewhere, and there was a job that uh, came up in Red Oak, Iowa, and I was called for an interview at that position. It was for a fifth grade uh, teaching position at Washington Elementary School. And so I, I went to Red Oak and interviewed for the position and learned during the course of the interview that they were looking for somebody with a science emphasis. Well, I'm, I was okay at science, but social studies was really my strength, and so I was very straightforward perhaps maybe just blunt, in that if you're looking for somebody with a science emphasis, I could do that, but there may be somebody that could do it better. And so end of interview, um, no job offer, and I knew when I walked out the door that day that I probably had just um, uh, left that one behind, that that wasn't going to happen. And I would have been very surprised had it, had it happened. But here's where God was working and weaving in uh, events that in my, in my life that were going to... Uh, uh, have an effect on me, and that is that a few weeks after that interview, I get a call from the superintendent of schools at nearby Stanton. Stanton was seven miles to the east of Red Oak, and the superintendent was asking the director of elementary education, have you interviewed any promising young male candidates for an elementary teaching position? And so he gave them my name and sent over my resume, and so then I get this call from the, the superintendent of schools at Stanton uh, asking me to come for an interview. I didn't really want to because Stanton was kind of small. And I'd come from small, and I knew what that was like. Uh, although Stanton was three times bigger than the town that I grew up in. So I interviewed at Stanton, and I was very fortunate. And then I connected with the high school principal who was going to be my supervising uh, administrator uh, during, uh, for my first year of teaching. I was pretty much offered the position on the spot. And so I'd had a goal that by... Um, the end of May, I was going to have a contract signed, and sure enough, by May 29th of that year, I signed a contract to teach sixth grade at Stanton, Iowa, uh, beginning in 1975. 
And so uh, I moved to town, and I'm looking for a church to go to, and I wanted a big church because I grew up in a small church, a church that maybe had at best 30 people in a Sunday morning service. And so I wanted to go to the big church because I wanted, I wanted that feeling. I wanted to be able to uh, just be around uh, a lot of people. And I went to the big church, and they didn't seem to really have any interest in, in inviting me or, or taking, taking me in. Uh, I thought primarily because I wasn't married, I didn't have a family. I don't know. I don't know to this day. The other church in town, there were two. There was the big church and the little church. The little church was down the hill. It was the Evangelical Covenant Church uh, of Stanton, Iowa. And I went to that church, and I was received with open arms. And I have to say there were probably four or five couples that were about 10 years older than me that just really took me under their wing, took care of me. I often, uh, well, I never had to really worry about, uh, not that I was worried, but I never lacked for uh, an invitation after uh, church on Sunday to go eat dinner at somebody's home. Um, and so food was a big part of, of my life then. And if there was free food, then I'm all for it. Uh, I have to say that Pastor Richard and Phyllis Lindstrom were very instrumental in making sure that if I didn't get invited anywhere else, that I could come there and have a, a Sunday meal with them. Uh, so thanks, thanks for the, to them and, and for their witness. Um, as part of that, uh, that period of time, uh, became a very significant period of time in that first year of teaching. It was in March of 1976 then that I'm, I'm new to this town, and I see they have a, a semi-pro baseball team that, uh, or a town team baseball team that played the, in a league of southwest Iowa, other southwest Iowa communities. And uh, baseball was a big part of my life growing up, even though at 9 or 10 years old at wiffle ball, I wasn't very good, or I wasn't good enough that I made the captain cry. But I did play a lot of baseball. I did play a lot of fast-pitch softball and even some slow-pitch softball. And so I thought, I'm going to try out for this semi-professional team. So I'm at Anderson Park in Stanton, Iowa, and I'm um, practicing, in developing or building arm strength, uh, throwing from second base to a target that I'd set up at home plate, um, and then stepping back farther. So I'm going back to center field, and, and while I never really did have a lot of arm strength, I was always very accurate, so I could always hit the cutoff, and, which was... Uh, a skill indeed, or a skill that was important as, uh, as important. Um, and while I'm practicing by myself, for some reason I'm, I'm starting to reflect on the, the year that's, that's taken place before me, the way I lived my life before that time, and I was moved by the Holy Spirit to go over to home plate, and for this arrogant man to do this is to get down on my knees and confess to God the sinful life that I had been living, and to ask Jesus to come into my heart one more time. And I count that time then as the time that I truly did receive Christ. Um, you don't know how hard it is for an arrogant man that's full of pride to get down on their knees, but that is one occasion when I did that, and the Holy Spirit was lead, leading me to do that. It so happens in the that fall of 1976, this was March of 1976, in September of 1976, I met Vicki. And that was exactly the person that I needed to have in my life at that time. Because as I still had that strong pull of the culture, and I, I came to a crossroads, and you know what Yogi Berra says, when you come to a, a fork in the road, you take it. Well, I could have gone either way. But God put Vicki into my life at that particular pro, uh, point in time. Um, and, and that's exactly who I needed because she kept me accountable, but she also had a love for Jesus. And um, my love for Jesus then grew because of her love for Jesus. And so uh, we met in the fall of 76. We were married in the summer of 1977. And then in 1991, a new pastor came to uh, the Covenant Church in Stanton. His name was Tom Gerritsen. Tom Gerritsen uh, was there uh, for six years. Um, he taught me leadership, and he also taught me about grace. And, you know, he prefaced every prayer. Whenever you start a prayer, he would always give thanks to God for the love and the mercy and the grace that he has shown to us. And that has stuck with me throughout these years because his message was a message of grace. Grace was always woven into any message that he talked about, how the grace of God 
uh, is there for us. Uh, it was, uh, I have to back up a little bit. It was during this period of time from uh, the time I got married um, that I stumbled upon this verse in Philippians. Um, ver- Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14 became my life verse. As a runner, this really resonated with me. It says, and, it, and just as a person, a prideful person, um, realizing that I don't have all the answers and I'm not the smartest person in the world. Uh, Paul writes in verse 12, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made it his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus that has been my life verse for the past 45 years and uh, will remain my life verse. It, uh, there's so many things that can be unpacked in, the, in just those three verses that speak to me. Um, in 1993, I attended Promise Keepers Conference in Boulder, Colorado. And I think probably some of you in the room may have done that same thing or have attended a Promise Keep- Keepers Conference. Promise Keepers exploded that year. Uh, the, we were on the campus of the University of Colorado in Folsom Stadium. Folsom Stadium sits, seats 53,000 people. There had to be at least 53,000 people, or if not more, there because of the seating on the, on the stadium floor. And the opportunity to be around men that loved Jesus and the example that they have, plus singing in a choir of 53,000 men, singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, is a, an, an experience as well as something that uh, resides deep in my heart as far as what, um, what God was doing in that stadium on, the, on uh, that weekend. <clears throat> and then part of Grace Community Church in 2003, another significant part of my journey was um, doing a spiritual gifts inventory. And in that spiritual gifts inventory, I learned that I had the gift of craftsmanship, intercessory prayer, giving and teaching. And I tell you that intercessory prayer became more purposeful because I knew now that that was indeed a a gift of the Holy Spirit. And um, just a couple weeks ago, uh, a name popped into my head of a youngster that I had uh, that was in the school that I served in Villisca, Iowa. And uh, she was in third grade when I came to Villisca and her name popped in my head. She was a troubled child and in trouble. Um, but I, uh, as I do that as, that, as that happens to me, then I offer a prayer. And if I don't know necessarily what to pray for, then I typically pray Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 to 26, where um, uh, Moses is writing that um, uh, it's, it's like, a, uh, like a benediction, and now it's, it's escaping me. Um, here, I just need a prompt. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the, his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. That's the prayer that I pray if I don't know necessarily uh, why that person's come, my, uh, name has come to mind. Uh, but I pray to God, uh, give them what they need at this point in time. So that brings us to the second part, and that is that we give thanks for an overarching grace. Paul moves from a personal grace to overarching grace in verse 15 by saying, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Here comes the Christmas message. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Verse 15, I think, is the very soul of the gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul displays an awareness of a graced heart, and he also notes that he's saying, I am a sinner. Not I was a sinner, but I am a sinner. Verse 16, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. I have found that the closer the walk with Christ, the deeper sense of humility. When I first came to Christ at, at the age of, of 23, my prayer was like this, as, a, as an equal to God. And as I have grown and deeper in my faith and grown deeper in uh, life experience, my posture is more like this, a posture of humility. 
because of all, all of what Christ has done for me. Romans 5.8 tells us that God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul knew what he had been and what he was and what he continued to be. Substitute the name Paul for Rick. Rick knew what he had been, what he was, and what he continued to be. But even then, Paul writes a little later in Romans that he doesn't understand his own actions. For I do what, not what I want, but the very thing that I hate. Now, some in this passage of Scripture have accused Paul of, of some false humility. Really, was he the worst of sinners? Was Paul worse than the Herods or the Caesars at the time? And my initial thought was, am I the worst than Adolf Hitler? Am I worse than Joseph Stalin or Mao Zedong or Paul Pot or Idi Amin or Saddam Hussein? All people responsible for the death of millions of people? Am I worse than that? The answer is yes. Yes, I am the worst of the foremost of sinners. Because James tells us that for whoever keeps the entire law, yet stumbles at one point, is guilty of breaking all the law. The only way we can be saved is through the blood that was willingly shed on the cross of Jesus Christ. In the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We often find ourselves chasing the wind religiously, trying to do things in order to earn our salvation, which... Maybe why we're here this morning or why some of you are here this morning. Our contemporary culture thinks that salvation is all about something done by us. The Bible tells us that salvation is something that was done for us. So which leads Paul to this expression of praise. And that in, in part three, and that is praise the God of grace. Up to this point, Paul has been emphasizing the work of God in terms of God's mercy and his grace and his patience. Verse 17 is a doxology that speaks of God in awesome terms. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the commentaries I read broke down this verse like this. Paul calls him king eternal. God is the king of all ages who sovereignly governs every age before creation, after creation, to the final age, and on to eternity. Paul calls him immortal. God is not subject to decay or destruction and therefore is in the most absolute sense imperishable, incorruptible, and immortal. And God calls him invisible, for the physical eye cannot see him. He lives in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. Think of Moses in the cleft of the rock where God says, you cannot see my face and live. And so instead, Moses views the glory of God as God passes by. All human beings have ever seen of him are glimpses of glory. Paul calls him only God, for he alone is, is what he is. Of himself, God has declared, I am the Lord. There is no other in the book of Isaiah. So that brings us to a conclusion, and that is uh, this time of year, the word resolve is used frequently. The word is an inward or denotes an inward decision to do something that may be bigger than originally thought possible, but at least to resolve to do something. And so as the first Sunday of the new year, I would encourage you, I would challenge you to make, resolve to make reading scripture a, a, a daily occurrence. You know, you can, you can come here to be fed once a week, but you don't eat food just once a week. You have to have food every day to sustain life. And so, same goes with scripture. We need it daily to help sustain our spiritual life I would uh, encourage you to resolve to become actively involved in a small group at church. I would uh, encourage you to resolve to invest in people that you have daily contact with and tell them the old, old story of Jesus and his love, either in your words or in your actions. And I would resolve that you would pray for these people, pray for your family, pray for your church, your community, state, national elected leaders. They need prayer I've asked Pastor Tim and, you know, on another uh, occasion, if he's standing here presenting the gospel, does he have the feeling that for some in the room, heaven or hell may be in the balance? And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But when I lived in Stanton, when I was young and when I was fit and when I was fast, my running route each day would take me through uh, a course through the town and I would uh, uh, head out towards Highway 34, which was north of town. And then I, at Highway 34, I would circle around and come back into town. 
And during the warm weather months when there was high humidity and the temperature was even higher, it was a lot of work and a lot of sweat and a lot of effort. But I found that when I reached the turnaround point at Highway 34 and started heading back south, that oftentimes I would turn and there would be a cool, refreshing breeze in my face. And that cool, refreshing breeze invigorated me and encouraged me to keep going, even though the work was still hard. Well, I liken that to um, what Jesus does for us. And the, the, the old hymn of the faith, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, comes to mind. I was still working hard. It was not easy. But today, if you ask if you turn your eyes upon Jesus and make a decision, if you haven't made a decision, Chuck Swindoll, uh, one time on a radio broadcast, I, hear, I heard him say, to not to decide is to decide not to. So if you want to know who God is, you've got to know Jesus. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Because heaven and hell might be in the balance today. So as the worship team would come back, uh, Brian, uh, Brad and Katie and Blake, um, pray this with me. If you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, pray this. Heavenly Father, I come before you realizing that I am a sinner and I do fall short of your glory. Father, I confess my sinful self to you. Forgive me my sins. Open my heart and enter in today. I turn my eyes upon you, Jesus. Please come into my heart. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Amen. And amen.